If you enjoy this channel, consider contributing to my Patreon. Anything you donate will be a huge help to me and will ensure constant content will be posted to this channel. Ori and the Blind Forest was released on March 11, 2015, and around a year later they released a definitive edition, which is definitely the better version to be playing, and I'll talk about why soon. But why am I just getting around to playing this now? Why didn't I play it when it came out? Well, around a week ago, this happened. Oh. What's up? Yo, if there's oh, like oh, what? Who the oh. hell? Orby? This is a new character. Is it Orby? Yeah. That was the Rivals of Ether's community to Dan Fornesi, the lead developer of Rivals of Ether, announcing that Ori was going to be the first guest character in that game. Now I actually had Ori in the Blind Forest in my Steam library for the last six months or so. I saw it on sale in the Steam store and figured it might be a game to eventually play through when I had the time. There was such a backlog of games from this winter that I just never really got around to doing so. With this announcement, I figured, well, now is the time to try it out. I saw the overwhelmingly positive reviews, I knew it had a good soundtrack, and it apparently had won a few awards for having an amazing artistic direction. Yet, even with knowing all these things, this game still managed to blow me away. Typically when a game is hyped up, it never lives up to your expectations, yet this game was hyped up and still managed to surpass them. Within the first five minutes, this game immediately announces its end goal, to immerse you in a fictional world with an emotional plot. The soundtrack is nothing short of stunning, and they deserved every art award they received. What's even more impressive is that this game gets you emotionally invested in characters without any real voice acting and very minimal dialogue through text. Almost everything is conveyed through actions and body language, something that would have failed horribly if they didn't take the art direction they did. As for the gameplay, this game is Metroidvania at its finest. There are two different kinds of Metroidvania games. You have the Metroid style, which is more about immersing yourself in a fictional world and exploration, and then you have the Castlevania style, which is more about combat and tough challenges through bosses and other enemies and, well, combat. Ori in the Blind Forest is the former, being much similar to, say, Metroid rather than Castlevania. In fact, there's not even any traditional bosses in the way you would expect, and I don't feel that that really harmed this game in any way. As you would expect from Metroidvania, certain parts of the map are locked off until you get new abilities, allowing you to bypass whatever roadblock is in your way. One of the reasons the Definitive Edition is the better version to play is because you get access to two new areas that weren't in the base game. In these two new areas you get two new skills that again weren't in the base game, and you get a backstory to Naru, one of the main characters. This isn't a spoiler, I promise you, but the two new areas are tucked above the very first spirit well you see but you just can't access yet. It's easy to forget that this even exists and play through the entire game without getting these new abilities and never experiencing these areas or finding the backstory of Naru. These new abilities are genuinely useful, so before you beat that last dungeon, I would recommend going back and getting them. Otherwise, if you're like me, you can beat the game without realizing that part of the map even exists. The other way the Definitive Edition improves over the original is that in the original, once you beat the game, you were locked out of your save. So if you wanted to explore the map and get all those collectibles that you missed, you couldn't, and you had to start a new game. Similar thing can be said about the dungeons. Once you beat the dungeon, you couldn't go back. The Definitive Edition solves both of these problems. Once you beat the game, you can explore the map as much as you want to. And after you complete a dungeon, you can go back at any point. Alright, I know I mentioned this game looks good graphically, but I really have to go more in detail about this. There is not one place on the map that doesn't have an extreme amount of polish to it. From the background and things that you will never actually access and there's no reason for them to be as detailed as they are, they're just there to look good, to the foreground of shadows and things possibly moving by. You would expect only the things you interact with to really have a lot of detail, but it's everything. Everything in this game is downright beautiful. But not only that, every part of this map conveys a specific tone, and it's part of the reason this game is so immersive. It also manages to do this while seamlessly transitioning from one part of the map to the other. Now I hear people talking about how the soundtrack deserves nothing but praise all the time, and that's true, but I rarely hear anyone actually talking about the sound effects themselves. Every sound effect in the game fits whatever is happening to make that sound effect. Ori makes lots of soft noises, for example when coming out of the water to take a gasp of breath. And on the opposite side, when something powerful is supposed to happen, like when you slam the ground, be expecting your room to shake with lots of bass.
The controls in this game are very responsive, and it never feels like I don't have control over my character. When I died, it was entirely my fault. Speaking of dying, you will die quite a few times throughout this game, but mostly from certain platforming sections rather than actual enemies. Now I know people get very emotionally attached to this game, so please don't kill me, but I do have complaints. In order to complete this game, there are three dungeons that you need to finish. The game generally points you in the correct direction, and the dungeons generally aren't too much of a problem, and were usually enjoyable. But at the end of each dungeon, there are escape sequences that I'm really not a fan of. These escape sequences are supposed to be the climax of the dungeon. There is something behind you in the form of a kill wall, whether it's water, ice, fire, something is going to kill you if you go too slow, so you're forced to hurry through a platforming section, and if you die, well you restart all of that all over again. There are no checkpoints in any of these escape sequences. This entirely ruins the pacing, it's supposed to be the climax of this dungeon, but it quickly turns into a frustrating trial and error experience, and you are going to die no matter how good you say you are at video games. If these sequences had just one checkpoint, it would entirely fix the problem. This is a bigger problem than you may think, because it entirely sours your mood for a game that you're supposed to be emotionally invested in. Again, this is supposed to be the climax of a dungeon, but turning it into a trial and error frustrating experience entirely ruins the pacing. Oh, and all this platforming comes with a lot of insta-deaths with no warning. There's no way to know these insta-deaths are a thing until they've already killed you. Then you restart from the beginning, get a little bit farther, just to get insta-killed by something else. And while we're on the topic of dungeons, I was not a big fan of the last dungeon in the game. It kind of turned into a tedious maze instead of the explorative experience I expected from the rest of the game. Not giving off any spoilers here, and it's very difficult to talk about this without giving out spoilers, but I also wasn't a big fan of the end of the game. There were some things about it that just didn't make any sense to me, and I'll leave it at that. Perhaps I'll make another video in the future talking about the ending, saying spoilers and big caps lock in the title so people will know, hey, there are spoilers here. I'm not sure if people will be actually interested in that. If you are or you aren't, please tell me in the comments below, and I may or may not make this video. The last complaint I had is a really minor one, but sometimes things in the foreground got in your way and made it difficult to see enemies. But that rarely happened. But at the end of the day, my complaints are largely just about my very subjective opinion about one of the dungeons I didn't like, and then the ending of all the dungeons. I'm harder on this game than I should be, because you're hardest on the games that you've genuinely enjoyed, and this game does so many things so flawlessly that I wanted the rest of the game to be flawless as well. There's no way I couldn't recommend this game, and there's no way I could spin it in any other way other than it is a must-play that everyone has to experience. This game fills a role that is very difficult to fill, and we don't really have many other games like it. We have plenty of Metroidvanias that take after Castlevania with incredibly difficult combat, and a lot of people can really get into that, but that elicits an entirely different response than immersing you in this fictional world. Even more so, this style of Metroidvanias is the most difficult to nail down. You do one thing wrong and the entire game fails and Ori in the Blind Forest nails it perfectly. I'm not sure where I've been over the last few years, but I regret not playing it sooner.